Good to see you, first of all, man. Lex, I've missed you. I think you've changed the lives of so many people that I know. And it's truly like a, such a pleasure to be back, such a pleasure to see you grow, to sort of reach so many different aspects of your own personality. Thank you for the love. You always give me so much support <laughs> and love. I just can't, I, 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 I'm forever grateful for that. It's lovely to see a fellow human being who has that love who basically does not judge people. And there's so many judgmental people out there and it's just so nice to see this beacon of openness. So what makes me one instantiation of human irreplaceable, do you think, as we enter this increasingly capable, age of increasingly capable AI, I have to ask, what do you think makes humans irreplaceable? So humans are irreplaceable because of the baggage that we talked about. So we talked about baggage. We talked about the fact that every one of us has effectively relearned all of human civilization in their own way. So every single human has a unique set of genetic variants that they've inherited, some common, some rare, and some make us think differently, some make us have different personalities. They say that a, a, a parent with one child believes in genetics, a parent with multiple children understands genetics. <laughs> just how different kids are. And, and my three kids have dramatically different personalities ever since the beginning. So one thing that makes us unique is that every one of us has a different hardware. The second thing that makes us unique is that every one of us has a different software uploading of all of human society, all of human civilization, all of human knowledge. We don't, we're not born knowing it. We're not like, I don't know, uh, birds that learn how to make a nest through genetics and will make a nest even if they've never seen one. Mm. We are constantly relearning all of human civilization. So that's the second thing. And the third one that actually makes humans very different from AI is that the baggage we carry is not experiential baggage, it's also evolutionary baggage. Mm -hmm. So we have evolved through rounds of complexity. So just like ogres have layers and <laughs> Shrek has layers, humans have layers. <laughs> There's the cognitive layer, which is sort of the outer, you know, most, the, the, the latest evolutionary innovation, this enormous neocortex that we have evolved. And then there's the emotional uh, baggage underneath that. And then there's all of the fear and fright and flight and all of these kinds of behaviors. So AI only has a neocortex. AI doesn't have a limbic system. It doesn't have this complexity of human emotions, which make us so, I think, beautifully complex, so beautifully uh, intertwined with our emotions, with our instincts, with our, you know, sort of gut reactions and all of that. So I think when humans are trying to suppress that aspect, the sort of quote unquote more human aspect towards a more cerebral aspect, I think we lose a lot of the creativity, we lose a lot of the, you know, freshness of humans. And I think that's quite irreplaceable. So we can look at the entirety of people that are alive today, maybe all humans who have ever lived yeah. and map them in this high dimensional space. And there's probably a, a center, uh, a center of mass for that mapping. And a lot of us deviate in different directions. So the, the variety of uh, directions in which we all deviate from that center is vast. I would like to think that the center is actually empty. Yes. That basically humans are just so diverse from each other that there's no such thing as an average human. That every one of us has some kind of complex baggage of emotions, intellectual, you know, motivational, uh, behavioral traits that um, it's not just one sort of normal distribution we deviate from it. There's so, so many dimensions that we're kind of hitting the sort of sparseness, the, the curse of dimensionality where it's actually quite sparsely populated. And I don't think you have an average human being. So what makes us unique in part is the diversity and the capacity for diversity. And the capacity of the diversity comes from the entire evolutionary history. So there's just so many ways we can vary from each other. Yeah, I would say not just the capacity, but the inevitability of diversity. Basically, it's in our hardware. We are wired differently from each other. My siblings and I are completely different. My kids from each other are completely different. My, my, my wife has, she's like number two of six siblings. From, from a distance, they look the same, but then you get, to, you, know, you get to know them, every one of them is completely different. But sufficiently the same that the differences interplay with each other. So that's the interesting thing, where the diversity is functional, it's useful. So it's like we're close enough to where we notice the diversity and it doesn't, uh, 
completely destroy the possibility of like effective communication and interaction. So it's, we're still the same kind of thing. So what I said in one of our earlier podcasts is that if humans realize that we're 99.9% .9 identical, we would basically stop fighting with each other. <laughs> like we are really one human species and we are so, so similar to each other. And if you look at the alternative, if you look at the next thing outside humans, like it's been 6 million years that we haven't had a relative. So it's it's truly extraordinary that that we're, we're kind of like this dot in outer space compared to the rest of life on earth. When you think about evolving through rounds of complexity, can you maybe elaborate such a beautiful phrase, beautiful thought that there's layers of complexity that make so So being. with software, sometimes you're like, oh, let's like build version two from scratch. But this doesn't happen in evolution. In evolution, you layer in additional features on top of old features. So basically, when I, like every single time my cells divide, I'm a yeast, like I'm a unicellular organism. And then cell division is basically identical. Every time I breathe in and my lungs expand, I'm basically, you know, like every time my heart beats, I'm a fish. So basically that, that I still have the same heart, like very, very little has changed. The blood going through my veins, the oxygen, the, you know, our immune system, we're basically primates. Our social behavior, we're basically new world monkeys and old world monkeys. We're basically um, this, this concept that every single one of these behaviors can be traced somewhere in evolution and that all of that continues to live within us is also a testament to not just not killing other humans, for God's sake, but like not killing other species either. Like just to realize just how united we are with nature and that all of these biological processes have never ceased to exist. They're continuing to live within us. And then just the neocortex and all of the reasoning ca capabilities of humans are built on top of all of these other species that continue to live, breathe, divide, metabolize, fight off pathogens, all continue inside us. So you think the neocortex, the whatever reasoning is, that's the, the latest feature? In the, in the latest version of this journey. It's, it's extraordinary that humans have evolved so much in so little time. Again, if you look at the, the timeline of evolution, you basically have billions of years to even get to a dividing cell and then a multicellular organism and then a complex body plan. And then these incredible senses that we have for perceiving the world, the fact that bats can fly and they evolved flight, they evolved sonar in the span of a few million years. I mean, it's just extraordinary how much evolution has kind of sped up. And all of that comes through this evolvability. The fact that we took a while to get good at evolving. And then once you get good at evolving, you can sort of, you have modularity built in, you have hierarchical organizations built in, you have all of these constructs that allow meaningful changes to occur without breaking the system completely. If you look at a traditional genetic algorithm, the way that humans designed them in the 60s, you can only evolve so much. And as you evolve a certain amount of complexity, the number of mutations that move you away from something functional exponentially increases. Mm -hmm. And the number of mutations that move you to something better exponentially decreases. So the probability of evolving something so complex becomes infinitesimally small as you get more complex. But with evolution, it's almost the opposite, almost the exact opposite, that it appears that it's speeding up exactly as complex complexity is increasing. And I think that's just the system getting good at evolving.